Our Father, we are grateful for Your grace that You have allowed us to have a Bible. And You've given us the Gospel, the knowledge of Christ to save us from our sins, that we would have this marvelous Savior we think about, sing about and that uh, we could have the Holy Spirit given to us to have understanding, to have faith, to have response to You and Your Word. And so we appeal to You right now to do as You've promised. Take Your Word by the Spirit's power, by the Spirit's work, and give us understanding. Give us insight as we meditate, as we think, as we apply Your Word to our lives. I pray that You would bless what You have ordained, the preaching of Your Word. Bless our ears and hearts as we hear and receive. And we pray that You would be glorified as we follow You in this way. We love You and we pray that uh, that our love for You would grow, our understanding of how to respond to even the structures that You have put in our lives, the structure of government and authority over us. We pray that You would help us to respond to what You have ordained for the good of society. And we love You. We thank You that Your Word has such rich truths, full of guidance and insight and direction for us for all of life and godliness. And we thank You that we can pray in Christ's name. Amen. We'll open your Bibles to Romans chapter 13. As we continue our study in this thorough letter of the Apostle Paul. And let's read the passage that we're working through. And I want to read a little before it and a little beyond it. Um, So start with me in chapter 12 and verse 14, and I want to read through chapter 13 and verse 10. Romans 12, 14, Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Verse 17 of chapter 12, Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved. But leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is thirsty, feed him. If he is is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger, who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For because of this you also pay taxes, for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other command, but it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment 
of the law. Well, we began considering this section of Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 7, two weeks ago. And as we did, I confess that it brought up way more issues than I can cover. Way more questions. What I've tried to do is explain the passage enough that we know what questions to ask, what principles to apply in order to evaluate and discern how to be faithful in whatever we face. And we can use that knowledge, we can use those principles, we can use those questions to assess the past. We mentioned some of those scenarios, American Revolution being one of them. But we especially want to honor the Lord in our response in the present. Because that's where we live, right? And as I read through verse 10 today, I wanted to do that to note what dawned on me at the end of Care Group last Sunday, and that is the focus on love. You know, in a democratic society where, where we vote for our leaders, where we have a say and an influence in government, there, there's so much to consider about that. But in the midst of all of that, it's helpful to recall our summary goal is love. Right? Love God first, obviously, but love your neighbor. That's the summary goal of it all. And so don't lose sight of of that supreme responsibility to show love by humbly serving and by boldly spreading the gospel. Uh, The gospel, the gospel is the only message that can change hearts. The gospel in Acts is what turned the world upside down, right? The gospel is what turned the whole world upside down like the early church did in Acts. And so we always want to keep the gospel central and supreme But it's interesting as well here in this section to note that Paul wanted to keep submission central. Submission central to our response to government as the Spirit was leading him to write what he wrote in this section. He kept submission central since government, civil government is a God-ordained authority. Verse 5 repeats and reminds us that it is necessary to be in subjection, which means to submit, to line up under, like we talked about, Romans 13, 1. Set this whole section up. That's the main point of the section. Submit to governing authorities. And that was the first point we noted as we got into this section. And then we looked at verses 1 and 2 then as giving reasons for that command. And we summed up those reasons by, by noting that, that we should see God above and behind those governing authorities. Submit to them. Why? Because God is above and behind them. Because God has sovereignly placed those rulers where they are. He has has wisely invented government that should motivate us then to submit to governing authorities. And then last week we we continued on into verse 2 and 3 and 4 to investigate why God ordained government. What is His purpose or His purpose is for having rulers over societies. Rulers that are always imperfect and may sometimes be evil evil rulers and verses two to four highlighted that that god's design for government is one to uphold basic morality and two to enforce basic justice there's a standard for good and evil innately inscribed on the human heart the conscience is used then to affirm or even to accuse each person People naturally, Romans 1 says, suppress that knowledge and unrighteousness, but it's there. And God designed government to uphold that at some level, to uphold moral law by by protecting and promoting good and by punishing what is evil. And that's why nearly all societies have laws against murder, against stealing, against lying. That's why most people that you speak to from any culture, will value honesty and integrity and faithfulness and generosity. Because there's a moral law hardwired into the human heart. God made humans that way. And He wants His government, He puts government in place to function with that authority to bring good in the world, to uphold good. So government is good for you. Really. I know we mock that. I know we sort of question that. But that's right. God designed government for good for you. Now, we can talk about modern government. We can talk about the problems with it. We can talk about 
maybe going beyond what God intended, but God designed it in general for good. Look at verses 3 and 4 again just to make sure you see that government is good. For rulers are not a cause of fear, verse 3 says, for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same, that is, from those authorities. For it is a minister, government authority is a minister of God to you for what? Good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. <clears throat> it's good. It's, it is good for good behavior to be praised, right? It's good for evil to be punished, to be called evil, to be prevented. It's good to have that. And that's a good function of government. That exercise of punishment highlights actually one of God's attributes that's also hardwired into the human heart. That is the attribute of God's justice. Right? You kids even understand justice because when your mom and dad get the ice cream out and your brother gets some or your sister gets some or your friend gets some and you don't get any, what do you say? Yeah. That's not fair. That's not fair. I want some ice cream because they got some there's a a standard a measure of of what is just now adults say the same thing in more sophisticated ways that make us think we're not whining but we really are but with adults and kids there's a sense of what's right of what's just of what's fair whether that's ice cream or whatever it is the problem of course is that we mess that standard up by thinking that all of us deserve ice cream all of us deserve reward or treat whenever we didn't, when we didn't even do anything to deserve it, when we didn't do anything to earn it. We don't deserve the gifts that we've not earned. And before God, the only thing that we deserve is punishment for our sin, for not obeying His law perfectly. So we can mess up that standard of justice that's hardwired into us but what we feel inside there is in a measure of fairness what is right it's a right it's right to see excuse me to want to see evil punished to want to see what's stolen repaid to want to see what's broken fixed for there to be reparation for there to be wrong made right that's a sense of justice and that's right to want that it's right to feel that Even as Christians, listen, even as Christians who are empowered by God, by His grace in Christ to forgive others, we still know crime does not pay. It cannot. Society cannot function. Lawlessness cannot reign. Society has to have laws and justice and punishment or it won't last. Everything will just run off into chaos. Verse 4 tells us without a doubt that God designed government to enforce that sense of basic justice. Now, we made that point last week, and I said when we did that we'd get into the details of verse 4 more this week. And so today, we're going to come to that justice. We're going to talk about that justice in verse 4, and we find three terms that highlight the role of justice. Sword, avenger, and wrath. How about those for happy thoughts? Sword, avenger, and wrath. I doubt most people like to talk about those things today. But those are good in this passage. Because we need to remember that every word of God is good, is pure and profitable and wise. So we need to see that here. Since God put these themes in His Word, and since He especially explained them in detail to His nation Israel and their government for their nation, we need to value what's here. We dare not go to this and say, you know, this passage is for just those politically motivated types. This is just for academic discussion or debates about the past. No. There are good things that we need to draw and understand from this passage. So I want us to grasp two broad truths. We're going to look at verses 4 and 5 this morning. Two broad truths that God is serious about that God is serious about as we examine verses 4 and 5. We're going to outline those, our, our walk through this with those two broad truths. 
about what, is, what God is serious about. Point number one, God is serious about criminal justice. Point number one, God is serious about criminal justice. Now we know that because verse 4 describes governing authorities as God's minister. Remember we said last week, that means that's God's deacon, God's servant. And it describes that servant, that service, in terms of bringing justice on criminal offenders. When evil is done, justice must be served. When a crime is committed, law is broken, what must happen? There must be punishment. There must be reparation of damages. There must be a righting of wrongs. God is serious about that. This is important. And it's so important that God explains this authority of the civil authority in this role as being an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. And that word avenger is used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 6 for God Himself. That He's the avenger. And so this is a lofty role. This is a serious role. It's the same word in chapter 12 we just read in Romans 9, 12, 19. We studied last one, same root word at least, uh, uh, that we studied that vengeance belongs to the Lord. It's, it's His. And we as, as individuals should not take revenge. Why? We shouldn't take revenge in our own hands. Why? Because... Because God's the ultimate judge. God's going to right all wrongs, either at the cross or in punishment in eternity. And and He is the ultimate judge. He'll handle it very well. He doesn't need us to take it in our own hands. But, why does chapter 13 come after chapter 12? Remember we said that when we started this. Another reason we don't get into personal revenge is because God put governing authority in place as the, here's that word, avenger as the place to go for vengeance, for justice. God instituted government, law enforcement, courts, civil authority, to be as mediators of justice on the earth. I was reading in First Chronicles this week, or Second Chronicles, in chapter 19 about Jehoshaphat and the people he put in charge as judges He said, this is serious business. You need to do this in the fear of the Lord that you don't bring guilt on yourselves and the whole nation. Take seriously under the fear of the Lord the serious role of being God's mediator of justice. God designed for vengeance to be accomplished, even in an earthly way, through the work of police and judges in the criminal justice system. And he uses that word avenger to tell us, listen, Vengeance is not wrong. Vengeance is not wrong. Rightful payback is not evil. It's right. It's right. When your stuff gets stolen, your stuff should be given back. You should be, there should be payment. God requires wrongs to be righted. There be recompense and punishment. That's justice. The point of verse 4 is the one who practices evil deserves it, deserves wrath. Deserves there to be punishment, wrath. The one who continually doing bad should be dealt with in that way. And listen, wrath can only be understood as involving angry emotion against something that's evil and punishing action against something that's evil. So there is a revulsion about it and there is an action against it. That's what wrath is. Evil deserves wrath. Government should bring wrath. So it's right, for example, for a society to cry out in disgust and revulsion against, for example, Penn State University and the scandal of sexual abuse that came out last year against children. Right? I mentioned that last week. Thank God when at least our society will still be shocked by some extreme evils. That's a good thing to have wrath to be poured out on evil in that way. And we should be brokenhearted for the many other messes in our society that are excused, the sins that are excused like adultery and homosexuality are just excused as as okay, acceptable when, when there is mess, there is trouble, there is heartache that comes in the result of that, in the wake of that. But we can thank God when government does have the desire for justice against some evils on other clear evils. That's right. That's good. And if you've had something done to you 
or to someone you love, you understand that. There is a righteous revulsion to evil. And that's not wrong for justice to be served by the government. We don't take it into our own hands. We don't hold it in our heart as bitterness. But there is justice and it is right. And it's not contrary, listen, it's not contrary to the gospel to call for justice and punishment. God can show mercy and forgive a person's sins by counting Jesus' death as the punishment for those sins eternally. And there still be justice on earth. Jesus' payment is for final judgment, right? A person can repent and trust Christ and have their eternal penalty washed away and still deserved by civil authorities to be punished. And people that come to Christ, sometimes on death row, I've read stories, sometimes they get it better than the rest of us. I deserve to be punished here. But I'm so glad I'm not going to be punished in eternity. There's a different level of justice and judgment there. There's the eternal and there's the temporal. There's the earthly. And no one deserves mercy at any level. But Christians shouldn't expect mercy from government just because we receive mercy from God in the final judgment. Because God is serious about criminal justice. He's serious about earthly justice so much that that He says governing authorities don't bear the sword. Rulers don't bear the sword for nothing. Verse 4 says, that phrase describes why we should fear. There should be a fear if we do wrong. If we do evil, we should be afraid. Because there is a divine commission in government to punish. And then that's described by bearing or carrying or wearing the sword. Now what's a sword used for? These days you display it on your wall. Right? It's sort of a nice historic relic. But what was a sword used for? Chapter 8 tells us, the end of chapter 8 of Romans tells us, it mentions it along with killing Christians unjustly. Right? Put to, death, put to death like sheep being slaughtered. And the sword is something at the end of Romans 8 does not separate us as Christians from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Violence and death are what the sword is used for. And also, the sword is used to accomplish a principle of limited, fair, Justice is the idea. Justice that is mentioned in Exodus 21, Leviticus 24, and Deuteronomy 19 with the principle of lex talionis, the law of the tooth. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And that God, God gave Israel that so they would be guided not to exceed that limit. Not to go beyond that. Because equal repayment of what's lost was what was fair, what was just. That equal justice principle extended even to a life for a life in the most extreme case of government using the sword. I mean, what else does the sword mean? The sword was used to take a life. And Paul's mention of rulers bearing the sword points to the civil authority taking the life of a murderer. That's called in our time, capital punishment. Capital punishment, right? That's a hotly debated topic and political issue in our day, but it's not vague or questionable in the Bible. It's the strongest form of punishment because it ends the life of the the criminal, but it's very clear from the very beginning. Turn to Genesis chapter 9. Very clear from the beginning that a life taken by a human requires the life of that murdering human in punishment. Remember, what happens in Genesis 9? What happens in Genesis 6 to 8, that is? The flood, right? And why did the flood happen? You read Genesis 6. The flood happened because there was so much violence on the earth. The earth was so ravaged by violence that God sent punishment on the earth. Punishment of everyone except He gave grace to Noah and his family. So then Noah and his family get off the ark and He's preparing Noah and all who would descend from him as they get off the ark, he gave clear instructions in chapter 9 to Noah. And he says, look at verse 6, or 5 and 6. 
Genesis 9, 5, Surely I will require your lifeblood from every beast I will require to, and from every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of a man. And here's the principle. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. That's government. It's not personal revenge, it's government. And then it gives the reason. For in the image of God, God made man. God made man. And so, God told Noah, whoever sheds man's blood, by man, by government, we learn as that's worked out, his blood shall be shed. And, it, and we know this is a lasting statute for all humanity because he gives us the reason. And the reason is because man is made in the image of God. Man is the peak special creation of God. And because God made man and woman in his image, therefore, to take that life, to kill that image of God, requires there to be payment of a penalty of life lost. In fact, as you read the Old Testament, what do you find at times in the Old Testament of God's judgment on nations? Why? Because the blood of the innocent victims was crying out from the ground. Recognize that phrase? Right? For, it was crying out for justice, for there to be justice. And God, when those nations didn't have justice, God brought punishment on those nations, often by other nations. But that kind of justice is rooted in the character of God. As always, God does what is right and just and fair and wise. God will bring all things to account. And He puts government in place to bring a fair penalty. And it's proper, equitable justice. And listen, that means, and this is part of the debate, that means capital punishment for murder is proper justice whether or not it serves as a deterrent to others. Now, it does serve as a deterrent. It does prevent others. But it's first about justice. It's first about the character of God and justice. Now, we know it also does serve to prevent. And we saw that last week in Romans 13, verses 2 to 4, right? There's fear. There's fear of punishment, right? That fear... Faithful punishment of evil by rulers is a profitable deterrent against those crimes. When people know, you know, the penalty for crime is real and serious and I'll get it if I do it, then they're going to be fearful to do it. They'll be fearful to do evil. They're going to be restrained from that. Sadly, in our society, the opposite is often true because the case is... Often criminals know they can get off. They know they're never going to be punished. They know you can just put it off for years and years and years and decades and decades and decades and never going to get it. So there's no justice and there's no deterrent either. Ecclesiastes 8.11 warns about that. Punishment delayed makes people not fear. Ecclesiastes 8.11 says this, Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly, therefore the hearts of the sons of men among them are given fully to do evil. I'll never get caught. I'll never get punished. I'll just keep doing it. That's the idea. And so, God instituted justice. Criminal justice. That's good. That's right. And so there should be fear. Sadly, another thing in our country is that we restrain law enforcement and military so much that they're the ones that fear doing their job rather than criminals fearing them. Military is a whole other issue, right? Bringing up military brings the role of one nation in protecting against another nation, right? One nation protecting good and punishing evil in response to another nation. Now, I don't have time to give a lengthy explanation of what's called the just war theory of when do you go to war, how do you go to war, how do you decide whether it's right or wrong to go to war, but there are right reasons for a nation to go to war. And, and I want to point out that the principles that we covered particularly last week about a government's purpose under God give that direction, give that insight for how do you know when a nation goes to war, when an, one nation commits evil against another nation. Just as government, just as individuals under government authority have to think through, well, at what point do I obey God rather than men? At what situation do I... 
weigh these issues out in a similar way. When one nation, for example, invades another nation and commits murder, really, right? See that? Murder against people of that nation, commits theft, stealing, against the people of that invaded victim nation. The victim nation probably has just and right reasons then to respond. And and it's their call as government to protect good and to punish evil for their citizens. So, So the victim nation then has just cause to protect its citizens. And that develops from there. There arise also numerous questions about neighbor nations, about how a nation in our time defends against potential threats in a global society, and how to promote good and punish evil in a broader way in the world. And those are things I'm not going to give you a detailed explanation for. Um, Those, though, require applying a passage like this to think through them. But listen, those are not issues that the Bible doesn't speak to. Those are issues people in roles of decision making and law enforcement and military leadership and government decisions should be experts on what the Bible teaches about these issues. And Romans 13, 1-7 is a mountaintop text on it. The truths we've covered should be familiar and thoroughly thought through on a regular basis for application to the decisions that are made by those who are in military, who are in leadership. Those are not easy decisions. And by the way, that's why we as Christians who are not in those positions should be passionate about praying for those who are in leadership. Because the more you think about, meditate on the truth of these scriptures and think through decisions we should be humbled not to easily jump to criticism of military operations but we should be quick to get on our knees and plead with god for wisdom for those who are leading for application of his truth that his that leaders would look to his word to make decisions that affect many lives here and around the world. I say all that to say, military and national defense and armed forces, and those can function internationally and nationally in a similar way that police officers function locally. So if the question has come up, can a a Christian serve in the the military? It's, It's really the same question to me as if a Christian can serve as a police officer or a government leader or any position of authority. The answer is yes. But the bigger question is this. Is the job being done, is the war being fought, is the role being played fulfilling God's design for government? When you're in that position, are you asking the questions, are you thinking through the issues of God's design for government, God's design for rulers, God's design for law enforcement, for criminal justice, for judges? Because God does speak to those issues. And... When we think in those terms, we should honor our leaders. They're in a position of honor, a position of great responsibility. We should honor those who serve in law enforcement, those who serve in the military, those who make decisions as judges in government office, in many roles as God's servant, as God's ministers, as God's deacons, in the role of government civil authority. They're doing what God designed. They're in a role that God designed for good. And particularly, that good is played out, is lived out by being serious about criminal justice. Because God is serious about criminal justice. Now secondly... Secondly, number two, point number two, God is serious about Christian submission. God is serious about Christian submission. And this gets us to verse five, which is sort of a summary restatement of the resounding command of the whole section. Read verse five again to see the point. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. It's not cool to mock authority. 
It's not cool to be a rebel. God put authorities in place to be honored. To be submitted to. To be in subjection to. Now, of course, we said before, Acts 5. Come on. Acts 5, 29. Acts 5, 29. I said it six times each week. Acts 5, 29 is one you can memorize and remember real easily. There's a time we must say, should I obey God rather than men? Acts 5, 29. Acts 5, 29. Acts 5, 29. Obey God rather than men. That's what Peter and the apostles had to decide to do. There is a time, there are situations where we obey God rather than men, obey His authority as the greater authority over men's authority who are under Him. But in general, the principle is to submit to rightful authority. And God is serious about Christian submission because we have reasons to submit that reach far deeper than a non-Christian. We as believers share one reason that we submit to government, that we share one with unbelievers, and that is the fear of wrath. And that's the first motive that Paul mentions in verse 5. It's necessary to be in subjection to governing authorities because of wrath. The wrath. Literally, the wrath. What's the wrath? Well, it's the punishment that's mentioned in verse 4. On crime, governing authorities bear the sword. They bring justice. That wrath the rulers bring on evil is is a motive. That's one motive for submitting. Kids, sometimes you obey because you know you're going to get spanked if you don't, right? If your parents do that, hopefully they do it under self-control and with love. But they do it because they love you. That's one motive for obeying. You say, I don't want the wrath from government. I don't want the consequences. There are bad consequences. That makes sense. Adults, you don't drive, hopefully, double the posted speed limit because you know the penalty for that is probably no license. Right? I don't know that that's... I think that's probably true. Didn't look it up. But you know the penalty will be bad if you're double the speed limit. You don't cheat on your income taxes. You don't steal from your workplace, hopefully, because you fear potential bad consequences. But all people, and especially Christians, have a higher motive, a deeper reason, a more effective restraint that leads us to submit to authority. And that, Paul says, the better motive is the conscience. Submission for the sake of conscience is better than submission for the sake of the wrath. It's one thing to want to avoid punishment. It's far better to want to avoid feeling guilty and instead wanting to feel a clean conscience. Wanting to know, I have obeyed what God has said in a measure. The human conscience is God's internal alarm system. It's the inside us that convicts our hearts and minds when we do wrong. And it tells us things that are right. The conscience responds. It's like a buzzer going off. It responds to the moral law that's written on the heart. gives affirmation or accusation. In Romans chapter 2, verses 14 to 16, describe it. The function of the conscience as accusing or else defending even a person who's never even had a Bible. And so the conscience operates in that way. Now, of course, we need to say, we need to clarify, the conscience can be misinformed when truth is silenced, when suppressed, when the conscience becomes seared or burned so it's no longer sensitive to sin, then it can no longer be functioning. Or similarly, if a wrong law is pressed onto a person's heart, like if you grew up getting guilt trips your whole life, you probably feel guilty for the silliest of things. Because you've been had this idea in your life that you just have to make everybody else feel good. Or something like that. Those, there are ways that manufacture the conscience can manufacture guilt based on wrong laws, wrong principles, wrong truths, errors, lies, pressed onto the heart, and then that grips the conscience in a way that is not functioning rightly. But when the conscience functions rightly, it can be a wonderful help. When the conscience is filled with the truth of God's Word, when it has clear directive from God, when those errors aren't directing the conscience, then it operates by giving encouragement and comfort for good, and discouragement and discomfort for what is wrong. And then we feel good about good, we feel bad about bad. Right? That's a good thing. That's God designed for conscience. <clears throat> and by the way, that again raises the, as we mentioned last week, 
the inescapable awareness that God has a moral law that transcends every society and every culture. Good and bad are transcendent terms and the conscience operates. They're not, good and bad aren't defined by rulers. They're defined by God and they should be honored by rulers. And so the appeal to conscience is ultimately an appeal to God. Ultimately, it's an appeal to God as the highest authority and His definition of right and wrong. And so here's the point of Romans 13.5. Our consciences should be informed that the norm in relationship with government is submission. Our default in relationship to government should be submission. The norm should not be backtalk, criticism, mockery, questioning, disdain, distrust, whatever it would be. The default should be honor, should be submission to those in authority over us because God put them there and therefore we honor His authority by honoring the authority He put in place. And we should want that because God is serious about it. I mean, it's revolutionary enough to say Jesus is the Lord of all and He's the only rightful King of our lives and therefore I'm going to follow Him. It's, it's, it's revolutionary enough to say, you know what, we're all sinners who are rebelling against the, the King of the universe and we're in trouble because He's bringing judgment on all of that. Those truths of biblical Christianity can be offensive enough to governing authorities who are often puffed up with pride or control freaks or threatened by any opposition. We don't need to create, especially in the biblical world, we don't need to create needless offenses and obstacles to the gospel by being unsubmissive to authorities. No, our honor for rulers should show others and rulers what a blessing Christians are to any society, what a, what a transformation the gospel brings about in someone who is naturally a rebel who's made transformed and changed and submissive. Christian submission is about the testimony of Christ and the gospel in our society. 1 Peter chapter 2 framed it up that way. 1 Peter 2, 13-17 says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God... Listen, that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Honor authority. Why? So that nobody has anything bad to say about the gospel, about the Lord. Our lives live to display the power of the transforming work of the gospel. Because after all, the gospel speaks of justice and God is serious about justice. And so we can talk about that. He's serious about Christian submission and criminal justice. And when we talk about the gospel, it brings up something that's so amazing beyond belief for everyone about justice. Because what is the reality of the gospel first? There is eternal justice to be served on everyone for our sin. God rightly demands equal payment for every crime. That happens earthly it happens in eternity. There's got to be equal payment for crimes against the Creator who is infinitely perfect, infinitely holy, infinitely loving, infinitely just and wise. Everything He says is out of of perfect love and wisdom. And so the fair and equal penalty for, listen, one sin, the fair and equal penalty for one sin against that infinite goodness of God is an infinity of penalty. That's why hell is an eternal punishment. Because one sin against perfection, just as a tooth for a tooth, an eye for an eye, a life for a life, stealing glory from the God who rules and owns all, the payback for that is an infinite wrath on sin in hell forever. And that's the right thing to do. That's fair. That's fair. That's equitable. That's what fair means. Equitable justice. And so that's why Jesus is so amazing. The gospel is so incredible. There's got to be equitable justice for every single sin that I have ever committed against God. God. 
And God says, I paid it on Jesus for you. And we sing, Jesus paid it all. That's what's played for the prelude. That's baffling beyond measure. This just and holy God paid the punishment, the equitable justice for our crimes if we trust Christ on His own Son. And so justice is satisfied at the cross for the people of God in Christ. That is why we call it good news. 2 Corinthians 5.21 sums it up. God made Him, God treated Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin. He made Him as if Jesus had committed all the sins of every person who would ever believe on Him. And He did that. Why? So that God could declare believers, make believers the righteousness of God in Christ. So that He would then count Christ's perfect life as belonging to us who believe. So if there's any argument about justice, about God who executes justice, who sends people to hell for just reason, about being too rigid or stringent or exacting, let's first realize what's right. When you want to be paid back when your stuff gets taken, you want want to be equitably restored when your stuff gets damaged. God believes in equitable justice. And yet, in Christ, He will not give us what we deserve. And so if you turn from your sin to faith in this marvelous Jesus, He will pay it all. That's what the cross is about. He will completely, He said on the cross, it is finished. He will finish the payment, the eternal payment for your sin if you trust Him. That is amazing. And that's the reason... We live in submission to government. That's the reason we want to pray for our leaders and treasure our freedoms because that message of the cross is what changes lives. That message is what we want to proclaim. That is what we want to preserve the freedom to enjoy and gather to sing about and to proclaim to others. The goal of having good government, having better government even than we have now, the goal is not so we'll just have more comfortable lives. The goal is so we can boldly spread the gospel. So we can gather together to be strengthened in application and study of this glorious gospel. The goal of government is that we would have a quiet and peaceable life for these purposes for the gospel.